Dr. Marie Orton is a professor of Italian at Brigham Young University. She is currently the Italian section head and a global women's studies affiliated faculty member. Dr. Orton received both her master's and doctorate in Italian from the University of Chicago. She also was a recipient of a Fulbright scholarship to Italy at the University of Turin. Dr. Orton completed her dissertation on the autobiographies of minorities in Italy and the violence they experienced. Her work includes researching the autobiographies on migrants, religious minorities, outro survivors, and former terrorists of the Red Brigades. Dr. Orton also has translated multiple works from Italian to English, such as Embarrassments, Daily Embarrassments in Black and White and Color, and Non-Persons, the Exclusion of Migrants in a Global Society. Dr. Orton is one of the most caring professors on campus and recently made BYU news by giving a Zoom class on how to make gnocchi. She studies immigration in Italy because she says it's on the forefront of immigration and the canary in the coal mine for new policies on inclusion and citizenship. Her research this summer expanded into the Black Lives Matter movement and how countless countries all over the globe were able to look internally at their own systems and policies and advocate for change everywhere. The title of this presentation is Women Migrant Writers in Italy and the International Black Lives Matter Movement. And I'd like to thank Dr. Orton for coming and I'll have all of us give her a warm welcome with a round of applause. Thank you very much. Can everybody see the screen? Great, thumbs up. And um, I wanna thank all of you for, first of all, everybody for coming. I want to thank Madeline for her prayer about having open hearts. And especially now that um, I wasn't aware of Dr. Siegfried's passing and those hearts are very tender right now. So thank you very much for coming. And um, I had Amy and Becca in class and many of you in class. So it's really wonderful to see you all here to talk about something I feel is super important. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement in Italy was a huge, huge uh, experience this summer. And I wanted to contextualize that a little bit by talking about Black Lives Matter um, internationally and how that played out in some places. And especially I wanna highlight the, the women who helped organize those movements in, in four other countries. And then we'll talk about Italy. So kind of half internationally, the first part of my presentation and half about Italy the second half. Um, one thing I want to, I'll just show my hand right at the very beginning. I want you to notice as we're looking at this, the age of these organizers, these women who organized internationally, I would like you to notice that. And I'd like you to notice how the Black Lives Matter movement um, really overlays onto issues of racial injustice, social inequity, and how those play out in different national contexts. In Italy, I'll just tell you right now, it has a lot to do with their citizenship laws because in Italy, you do not become a citizen because you're born there. They have what's called a eus sanguinis law, which means your nationality is passed by blood. So only the children of citizens can become citizens. This is very problematic for the over 1 million children and young adults now whose parents were migrants. So they were born and raised in Italy, but they don't have a path for citizenship that's realistic at all. So we'll we'll talk about that. Um, I, I wanted you to see this beautiful poem by Rupi Kaur because I feel like it embodies exactly what so many organizers over the, summer, the summer's protests and also especially the women who were involved. It, it exactly um, shows what, what the spirit of that movement is. Okay, um, when George Lloyd was murdered in May, there were demonstrations that erupted immediately and um, we can't talk about exactly how that played out everywhere, but I wanted people to realize that a lot of what did happen was because women mobilized. And when Black Lives Matter was founded in 2013, um, in about two years, it became already an international organization. The brilliance of that was that women networked with other women. There were men involved, of course, widely, but most of what happened in terms of international um, demonstrations about Black Lives Matter this summer were because there were there were programs and nonprofits and all kinds of other organizations that had already started to partner as early as 2014 with Black Lives Matter. The biggest group is BLM 
UK, where there were, and in the United Kingdom, there were the most protests outside of the United States. I wanted to give you just some kind of numbers because it was so fun to say those numbers to Asia and Becca and Amy when they came to my office and they were pretty flabbergasted. Um, so that we can, in Utah, if you were in Utah this summer, we didn't necessarily see the numbers as widely um, where we were living, but in other places, it was pretty dramatic. And globally, this has been the biggest demonstration in the history of the world, collectively. So over 15 million people in the United States demonstrated. There were demonstrations in almost, on almost every continent, 60 countries. And um, some of those demonstrations were very small. Some of them were 75,000 people as they were in Philadelphia. What I wanted to point out to you is if you ever need information, and you never know if you might, about peaceful protest, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace Protest is where you want to go. They have details on everything. I did not appreciate before I was doing research for this presentation that there have been hundreds of thousands of BLM demonstrations since this summer. So when Dr. Rue two weeks ago talked about um, Black Lives Matter as the civil rights movement and that we're living in the civil rights movement of this generation, he is absolutely right. So I hope you're getting questions together. I wanted to say, as I said, I wanted to talk about how um, some of these demonstrations worked internationally and look at how racial justice, um, what the main issues are in different countries before we look at Italy. So in Japan, um, Katima Ai is the person who helped organize the most in Tokyo. And as you can see, she um, has, what can I say? She has faced a lot of prejudice in Japan. She grew up there. Her parents split when she was just a baby and her father's from Nigeria, he returned. Her mother raised her as a Japanese person in Tokyo. But there's a very, very small number of people of color who live in Japan and are Japanese citizens. She has citizenship. She, she says, and I thought this was interesting, that you know, lots of countries you know, ignore people who are different. And in Japan, they've raised that to a high art. Exclusion is, occurs through, through ignoring. So from the time she was very young, um, those kinds of things that, that you read about actually were her experience. People wouldn't sit by her on the, on the metro parents didn't want their children to play with her or share a desk with her at school and those kinds of things because she looks different. She has a different phenotype. Um, she works on the radio. She's a radio announcer because she says people accept her as Japanese as long as they don't see her. But the first impression people have of her is that she can't possibly be Japanese. There isn't really a tradition of police violence in Japan. That's not how Black Lives Matter played out in Japan. Everywhere there were Black Lives Matter movements internationally, they were clearly sending a message of solidarity with the United States, but also her goal was to give Japanese people an awareness that there are people who have different heritage and are still Japanese. She wanted to expand that definition of nationality and she wanted to push back against this idea of exclusion or that you have to look Japanese in order to be Japanese. Um, she brought up the issue of, um, I'm gonna say her name correctly, Ariana Miyamoto. You might have issues with beauty pageants and I do too, but in 2015, Miyamoto was um, Miss Japan and there was a great big scandal because people were not happy. A lot of Japanese people were not happy that she would be chosen to represent Japan in this competition because she is what the Japanese called hafu, her father is an African-American man and her mother is Japanese. She is half, she is mixed race. And um, it actually took some legal work for her to be able to, despite the fact she has citizenship, it took some legal work before she could publicly represent Japan. Another person that became involved was um, Naomi Osaka. If you're a tennis fan, you know that she is a Haitian Japanese Jap tennis superstar. And I think she beat Serena Williams yesterday in the Australian, um, open, but she has, um, her sponsors have typically lightened her skin or straightened her hair when they, when they use her image in promotions. And she has had to stand alone against those kinds of acts of prejudice, because again, there's not, not yet in Japan, 
an open discourse about how these forms of exclusion are harmful to people. And that's a lot of what IE is trying to promote an awareness and to create a social, a social discourse about these kinds of exclusion. So as I say, I hope you're getting lots of questions together as we talk about these things. I wanted to talk a little bit about Brazil. If you've taught, if you've had any classes in Brazilian culture, you should have heard about Jamia Ribeiro. Did I say her name correctly? Because Dr. Hegstrom is the Portuguese speaker here. Um, she just turned 40, but she spent almost her entire adult life working for women's rights. And she partnered with, um, as you can see here, what they call Vidas Negras Importan in Brazil. And she organized most of the country's um, protests this summer. Her, besides showing solidarity with the American movement, one of her great um, uh, points that she wants to show is that race, just because there's such a variety of racial information and there's a long history of racial mixing in Brazil, we should not assume that means that racism has been overcome. Quite the opposite is the case. In Japan, as in Italy and France and many places in Europe, they don't even take they don't even take census data about race. They don't track race at all. So it's very hard to give data about some forms of discrimination. In Brazil, you have exactly the opposite situation. We have lots of information about racial discrimination. And Brazil, remember, was the last country in the world to outlaw African slavery, 1888, which sounds like it was a long time ago, but the grandmother who raised me was born in 1901. So it's not, it, to me, it doesn't seem as far away. Um, Brazil has the largest population of African diaspora. So the most African descendants outside of Africa live in Brazil. They have a long history of following race according to five very imperfect categories, which are branco, which is white, preto, which is black, pardo, which is multiracial, amarelo, which is Asian, and indígena, which is indigenous. And you can see already that if you have a lot of racial mixing, which Brazil has a long history of, those categories fall apart because phenotype doesn't match necessarily what descendants is. And also then you have overlays from, from class distinction and gender distinction. So I looked up some of the studies about race in Brazil and it will not surprise you to know that teachers will always, not always, but there were overwhelming statistics about middle school teachers grading lighter skinned students better, even if the scores were the same. And even if their comportment and their behavior was just as well behaved, if they were lighter skinned students or if they were categorized on paper as white, they got better grades than students who were not. Also statistically in terms of economic disparity, the salary of whites in Brazil is on average 50% higher than the salary of blacks. There, and these are the kinds of inequalities that Hibiero is working against. She also is extremely interested in how this plays out in terms of um, legal protection for women because there aren't reproductive rights in Brazil. And because if women are, um, we're talking about women of color in Brazil, the likelihood of domestic, ex of domestic abuse skyrockets. They're 10 times more likely to experience domestic abuse and to be less protected by laws. So sh this is part of what she's working about um, and has been doing for many years. Okay, Canada. This, this woman, Ymir, organized a nonprofit just a couple of years ago which is, if you can see it here in the title, Agnalenia Bisedet. It's an Aramic word, which is the word, which is the language they speak in Ethiopia, where she's from. And it means from migrants for migrants. And I'll just give you a little of the background. You can see some of it here about her. She was, she was recruited, as many women are, to be a domestic laborer in the Middle East. And people from the Philippines, women from the Philippines and certain African countries are very are very heavily recruited. And she was promised that if she went to Lebanon, she would be given a salary of over $1,000 a month and have days off and there would be possibilities for education. So of course she went and she was basically enslaved when she got there by her sponsor. Um, her passport was taken away. That's very standard procedure because your employer is your sponsor under the Middle Eastern migration laws. 
So they have complete control over the people that come. She was not paid. She was made to sleep outside. She was not given a phone. And she had, she had no contacts there. She had no relatives. She had no way to, to contact somebody and, and to get help. She didn't always have her own personal needs met. So thanks to a United Nations relief program, she escaped from Lebanon and she resettled. And one of the first things she did was set up this nonprofit to help women who were trapped in similar situations. And as you can see here, there are a quarter of a million domestic workers from mostly Africa and the Philippines who um, work under this system in the Middle East. It's called the Kafala system. And by that system, that, that migration law, the sponsors have complete power because they're also the employers over the people that work there. Um, their situation has become absolutely desperate under COVID, in the times of COVID because more and more families are um, having financial difficulties. And so they abandon their, their domestic workers. Some of them just abandon them on the streets. They have nowhere to go. They don't have money. They don't have food. And there was even a man in Lebanon who tried to sell his domestic worker on Facebook. So they're completely controlled. When she organized with Black Lives Matter and partnered her group with there this summer, in addition to Solidarity, this is part of what she was wanting to raise awareness about and, um, and to improve. Okay, um, am I already here? Okay, great. Okay, in Australia, one of the organizers, Linda Junko is um, an indigenous person. I'm gonna pronounce the name of her tribe correctly. She is from the Wajeri tribe, which is the largest of Australia's indigenous people. There are 800,000 indigenous people living in Australia, which is just about 3% of the population. But are you ready for these statistics? 30% of the male prison population is indigenous and 36% of the female prison population is indigenous. So part of her, the organization she works with and her partnering with um, BLM was to respond to this kind, of, this kind of disparity. Also, there is a history of police violence against indigenous people in Australia a person who is in police custody and is indigenous is 10 times more likely to be killed in custody. Just since her, um, the protest she organized this summer, five more indigenous people have been killed in police custody this, um, this year. And um, as she has pointed out, not, never has there once been a conviction related to um, the death of an indigenous person in police or state custody. So, these are the kinds of issues that people are, are working with and the kinds of ways that these permutations have, have, um, have worked out. So let's talk about Italy. Excuse me. Okay. Black Lives Matter in Italy was a huge big deal. My friends were talking to me and, and Zooming with me to tell me about what was going on. There were Black Lives Matter um, organizations and protests in almost every single major city in Italy and even in some of the smaller ones. Um, the one in Piazza di Castello in Torino was probably, I think, one of the most dramatic. And I'll talk to you about who the organizer of that was. Excuse me. She, um, she wanted people to, she had, she had three, I want you to imagine 3,000 people kneeling in a piazza for eight, eight minutes and 46 seconds in this time of silence and it was completely silent while they were while they were having this kind of protest they also had lots of um musical performers which is one thing that i think is not specific to italy but that is very pronounced in italy namely that the the line between artist activist and academic has become very blurred and a lot of artists have become activists a lot of activists have become academics and those, those categories are very much, or very fluid. Um, the song that uh, Dr. Hegstrom said I could play, and I'll play for you at the end, we had playing a little bit at the beginning, was one written by an African rapper named Amir Issa. He's very internationally known. He wrote this in honor of George Floyd, non respiro, in Italian means I can't breathe. And um, if you have time to stay afterwards, I'll put it on YouTube or you can look for it yourself. Um, he has, he does the rap, but he has it voiced by people who are 
who don't have citizenship in Italy, the children of migrants or people who are migrants and they don't have citizenship. Because as you can see, what he's trying to say is these issues of social equality play out very much in terms of our, their citizenship difficulties in Italy and how the G2 or the second generation is not able to be recognized and have citizenship. The other song I was going to play for you is by another rapper, Tami Kuti, Afro Italiano. It's probably been the other big bestseller. And he's trying to talk about having blended identities. And he is, his family's from Nigeria, but he also has not been able to get citizenship because he is a child of migrants. On their t-shirts, they're saying, we are Italians without citizenship. Okay. Another reason Black Lives Matter resonated so much through Italy is because in the past two decades, there have been rising incidents of, of all kinds of violence and racist um, hate crimes. The first real waves of non-Europeans into Italy started about 25, 30, well, let's say 30 years ago. I say here in the 80s, that's where there was a trickle. But by the 1990s, it had become a flood. And by the by the 2000, it had become kind of a tidal wave. Part of the reason for that is Italy has almost 6,000 miles of coastline jutting out into the Mediterranean. And so it's very easy to get to from lots of different places. In the 1980s already, there were a few racially motivated attacks. Jerry Maslow was the first one who that we know about, a person who was an, an African migrant who was killed in a racist attack in Rome. And there was a protest of over half a million people walking in the streets to protest this. So it's become a very polarizing issue in Italy um, about how they're, they're, the, they're the kind of I'm going to use this terminology, make Italy white again movement. And there's the opposite of that, but it's become a very divisive issue. And if you've been to Italy, you've probably talked to people on both sides of, of that political divide. In 1992, there a new party was born, La Lega Nord, which is now just called La Lega, which means the League. And they're one of their founding doctrines and the way they came to power is we will keep migrants out of Italy. Um, they are now the party that is in power in parliament. They are the party that were responsible for setting up detention centers where migrants were held. Anybody who couldn't have, couldn't produce documents at that moment was taken immediately to a detention center. These have been disbanded, but for over 20 years, they had detention centers where people were separated from their families and they were held there without any form of communication and a there was no possibility for um, nonprofit groups or for journalists to come in. So they were called CPTs and Centri di Permanenza Temporanea, and they've been disbanded, but that was what the Lega Nord really promoted. Black Lives Matter also wanted to bring up the death of these two um, African migrants, and I'm so sorry, I didn't have Sakla's date here. This was in 2017. Um, the second person, the smaller picture that you see, is someone who worked in Sicily. He was part of a shanty town where 2000 migrants lived together and worked in the orange groves. And a local man came by and accused them of trying to, he, they'd been scavenging uh, materials to build shanties. And he claimed that this Italian man claimed that they were stealing from him and he open fired on them. Um, this Sacco is the one who did not survive. Um, the, the person whose picture above, Gubre, was attacked that happened, as you see, in 2009, but it was just, the sentence for it just came down. Don't be alarmed, that's sometimes how long things take in Italy. Um, and the two men who beat him to death for stealing a package of, shoplifting a package of cookies in a bar, um, they beat him to death for that. It was the bar owner and his son, and they were just sentenced to 15 years, which was shocking because in Italy, normally a homicide warrants uh, life imprisonment. There's no death sentence in Italy. Um, I wanted to just give you some idea about some of the conditions that migrants are under and how many, how dangerous it is to be a migrant in Italy. And again, just remember that the citizenship debate is one of the main issues here. I want to point out, especially because I see so many of my Italian students here, at least from my classes, if you would watch any of these documentaries by the Italian Ghanaian film director, Fred Cuorno, they are all in the BYU library, you can access them. And he's talking about these exact kinds of debates. 
counts as an, as an evento culturale, okay? So if you want to know more about these kinds of things, um, he's done several autobiographies about it, subtitled for anybody else who wants to see them. Okay, I, want, I promise I'm gonna tell you about the two organizers who were so instrumental in BLM this summer in Italy. One is named Ariem Tekla. She is the founder, she's a filmmaker too, like Fred, and she um, organized a podcast just recently and she calls it Black Coffee. And she's, she brings up all these issues of, of nationality, the idea that why do we call second generation migrants like herself? Why does she, why she asks, why am I called a, a migrant? I was, I was born here. How is, is migration genetically transmitted? Why am I being tagged in this way? And then what would my children be? Are they third generation? Are you never, when do you ever get out of migrancy is her question. These are the kinds of issues she brings up. Um, and also too, she's been very, very active in terms of one of her main, I would say, I keep thinking of Italian words because I'm looking at my students, her cavallo di battaglia. One of her main points is to combat the negative representations of blacks in the media. She feels like there aren't very many at all. And when there are media representations of black, they're always criminalized. And she's not wrong about that. That's one of, as I was saying, that's one of the areas where academics and activism has really become um, very active in Italy. Her friend who organized the, the demonstration I described in Torino is um, Esperanza Ripanti. Her autobiography has not yet been translated into English, but as I say, my students can read it. Do you like her title? E poi basta, which means I've had it, enough is enough. She talks about, as Tecle does, this representation in the media of what it is to be black in Italy. And she talks a great deal about what that means in terms of how she is treated. She felt like her gendered self and her racialized public self became very apparent around puberty because that's when um, men started following her home or she would you know, get off the bus with her backpack and men would say, you're black, you must be a prostitute, offer her money, try to pull her into cars. She was treated from the time she was about 12 like the media representation people saw of black women, which was prostitutes mostly. So she has also been very, very active about that. I wanna talk about some of the other debates. I'll be really fast because I know you have time for questions. I want you to. Um, some of the other debates that Black Lives Matter brought up, things that had already existed, but that got a lot more public press because of this. And one is um, the history of, of colonialism in Italy. This is still very repressed in the Italian culture and in the Italian imagination. Italy had five African colonies. They talk about exactly none of them. And um, in, in school, they don't study it. They, uh, the, the, their colonial past went pretty much from the 1880s to till fascism ended in the 1940s. Um, unlike France, they do not grant the children born to soldiers and um, women in Africa citizenship. So none of those children could have citizenship. And I'll get to that in a minute. The representation of colonialism though was a big issue for BLM this summer. It already had been in the past. As you can see in this statue, and let me just tell you a little bit about him. This is Indra Montanelli. He is a journalist and he was, a, he was at first a big fascist supporter and then he became a fascist um, counter supporter in the 1940s. He became what's called a partigiano. He was one of the freedom fighters in World War II, and he fought against Mussolini after having first supported him. So he became kind of a national hero because of, I mean, post-World War II. He became a national hero because of his anti-fascist activities. And then he became twice a hero because as a journalist, he was um, kneecapped by the Red Brigades when he was walking in this garden in Milano. And so he, he kind of had this fame as a freedom fighter. Okay, but when he was in his late 20s and early 30s and living in Italy, excuse me, living in um, Ethiopia in the colonies, he bought a 12 year old African girl and kept her as a wife for several years, I think about five years. And um, when he left Africa, he sold her to another member of the, of the colonial um, army. 
this came to light after the war in the 60s, and he wrote a defense of his actions. And his defense was, African girls aren't like European girls. That was his defense. Um, he, as I say, he came under a lot of fire. This statue was erected in 2009. And so 10 years ago, 11 years ago, this was this, this debate came up again and again. Um, the people who are vandalizing the statue are saying he's a racist, racista, and then stupratore is he's a, he's a rapist. Um, and these are some of the activists and academics and artists who have worked specifically about not the statue. It's not just about the statue or taking down the statue. It's about, it's about taking into account and really considering Italy's colonial past and how that colonial past affects how people are treated now in Italy, especially when they come from the former colonies. So the woman um, in the middle is Ijaba Shego. Anything you want to read for her if you're in my classes, total cultural event because she is fabulous. Um, she has written, I think, seven or eight books, and she is very much um, active. She was very active in BLM, but she's also very active in changing the representation of Blacks in Italy. The woman on the right is Angelica Pissarini. She will be at a roundtable conference that um, I'm helping to organize for the first two weeks of May. And she also is somebody who crosses that line of academic artist and an activist. She's a professor at NYU. And most of her work has been about how we racialize people in, in Italy and also which I guess is kind of autobiographical for her as well but also um, she writes a great deal about the whole idea of privilege. Her most recent essay was Una Questione di Privilegio. So in May, you can totally come to her talks when she's here. The last thing I wanted to bring up is, I want a success story. I want you to know about a success story that not just Ijaba and Angelica, but others helped work with. Part of what they want to do is recuperate the contributions that that African descendants have had in Italy. And this picture is Giorgio Marincola. He was a partigiano. He was a freedom fighter, an anti-fascist freedom fighter. Um, he was, his father was a colonial soldier. He and his little sister were born in Eritrea and were abandoned there by the father. And then the father came and got them, abandoned the mother and brought them back to Italy to be raised by their grandparents because their fathers, um, their father never had anything more to do with them and their stepmother didn't wanna have anything to do with them. He was very brilliant. He went to medical school. He, he dropped out of medical school to fight against Mussolini when he was um, a young man in the 1940s. And he, he it would be a movie, you guys, it would be a total Bond kind of movie. He trained with special forces. He, he parachuted behind Nazi lines. He saved all of these people. He was one of those really heroic, dramatic partigiani. What really makes me, how can I say this, humble and angry at the same time is that he did all of this for a country that refused to recognize him as a citizen. Um, but a biography came out about him in 2008 and the, bi the biography was printed on purpose to show the contributions that, that African Italians have had culturally. And thanks to Ijaba and Angelica and other people, they did persuade um, the city of Milano to rename a metro stop in Marincola's honor. So when, not if, when you go to Italy, stop at the Marincola metro stop in Milano because it's proof that even Italian bureaucracy can be budged. Okay, my last thing I promise is just this thought. My other, I think, encouraging positive thought I want to leave with all of you is this statement by Octavia Butler because I think it relates to this movement but also this generation that changes will occur. We cannot even begin to imagine. And the next generation will be both utterly familiar and wholly alien to their parents, I think in good ways, in good ways. So thank you very, very much for your attention and I'm ready for your questions. Alrighty, so first we'll have the response. And so 
As we've seen from this presentation, during the summer of 2020, over 100,000 Black Lives Matter demonstrations took place in the United States. Internationally, there were comparable numbers with the Black Lives Matter demonstrations in more than 60 countries across six uh, continents. And in Professor Marie Orton's work, she demonstrates the Italian case and how the Black Lives Matter demonstrations merged with racial justice issues, particular to that national context and history. And so from Professor Orton's work, we learned that Italy has had a really difficult time changing its national concept. And in Italy, like what she told us, um, you cannot be a citizen just because you're born there. Their law is that citizenship is passed through blood. And so for the 3 million children of migrants who were born and raised in Italy, their citizenship has to wait until they turn 18. And then once they do turn 18, they, be they can begin the 10 year process of asking for their citizenship. And so with this research, we are able to see Italy serve as a canary in the coal mine um, because it is the forefront of many migration trends, but also because it's a country that has led, that has to deal with national concept and Italy is the forefront because when we talk about these issues of inclusion, um, Italy is a really immediate place where we can see the policies create culture. Um, and pertaining to the Black Lives Matter movement, we know that Italy is a multiracial country. Um, but what we see is that the people who look the most different, who are the most different in this country, are the ones who receive the most violence pertaining to African Americans and minorities in the country. And so many countries like Italy and other countries have used the Black Lives Matter movement and metabolized it to bring awareness to their own issues within their country as well. The work of Professor Orton can lead to many other global accomplishments. From her work, we hope to see a change in standard curriculum. Society often overlooks important research about global social issues in favor of other countries, but this research needs to become the norm. Professor Orton's work shouldn't be seen as something extra or something that we have to pretend to care about to please a certain group of people. Intersectionality is important to us as members of the global women's studies community, and Dr. Orton's work should be integrated into our dialogue and rhetoric so that we can adopt view of national identity. We should each look at our own culture with a critical eye and from many perspectives. Research should produce knowledge and change the way that we look at commonly asked questions. We should hope to see this type of research continue in many other parts of the world on these same issues as racism is a global problem and we need everyone everywhere to be involved in the eradication of it. As we all grow in our lives, we can learn from Professor Orton's research how blind we are. We can know that our education at Brigham Young University is not an arrival point, but a constant invitation to humility. If we do not take that invitation and learn about other people's lives and live in their stories, then we miss the purpose of our education and life. If we all want to be a part of an inclusive society, we cannot be intimidated by our limitations, by the limitations of our society, and we cannot be intimidated by other people's stories. As humans, we all have to be willing to grow. As global women's study students, we need to heed to this research and continue to learn more. We will now turn the time to Hannah Robinson, who will lead the Q&A. Awesome, thank you, Hannah and Asia. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Orton. I really, really enjoyed your presentation. You talking about the demonstrations in the piazzas across Italy gave me actual chills, so thank you. Um, so for starters, I'd like to ask the first question, um, and I'll try to word it as eloquently and understandably as possible, but looking at how the Black Lives Matter movement has kind of swept across the globe and created these international waves, how can and should we as young adults living in America respond to and learn from the international movement that has changed the way that we see the world? I'm so glad somebody asked that because I love the move forward kind of question, right? Like, what do we do? I'm glad people are invested and they really mean it and they want to do something. So I appreciate what Hannah said and what Asia said. And first of all is realize you're at a time where you can affect change and don't think you can't. Don't be intimidated to thinking you can't affect change. Um, I would say change wherever you are, that kind of Elder Uchtdorf lift where you stand approach. Because for example, um, one of the things I plan to do today is contact Mike Lee and Mitt Romney because there's a bill before Congress now about migration law reform in the United States that would give a path forward to the children um, who were childhood arrivals. And so the dreamers could get citizenship through this. I plan to let my 
elected officials know what I think they need to do to represent my my concerns and your concerns. And I would say, you come from different states. I would say you can always let your elected your elected officials know what you what you care about. And I would urge you to do that, in, because as Asia said, policies do create cultures. They do. And if we have different policies and we change our policies, we'll have a different culture. It's not enough to have that idea that I'm a nice person, so I can't possibly be a racist or act in racist ways. That's intensely naive. I think we can all do things. I also really, oh, I'll, I'm, people are making motions, so I'm going to stop. But I think we can always, you can, when you see something and you see a problem, you can do something that might sound vague, but whether that's, you know, talking to somebody about a comment they make, asking your teachers if you can read certain um, texts in the class, especially as Hannah was saying, let's make this part of not like something extra we have to pretend to care about Hannah, thanks for saying it like that, but that it's part of what we do all the time. This is why texts by women are now studied in classes. This is why we have a global women's studies program, because people required it and mostly students required it. Awesome, thank you. Um, all right, and then from Brooke, we have this question, why have citizenship issues in Italy lasted for so long? What social beliefs have perpetuated the idea that nationality is passed by blood and not birth? And what nationality do these people identify with if they're not allowed to become Italian citizens? I love your questions because these are all the things in my notes I wanted to say and I was trying to be faster. So thank you for the question. First of all, a lot of these people don't have a nationality. They identify as Italian because that's what they know. Their friends are Italian. These are the sensibilities that they have. Um, but often that if their parents migrated, the home country doesn't allow them to claim citizenship. They don't have residency. In Italy and in many places, citizenship is connected to residency. So as Asia was saying, students or students, at 18, childhood arrivals can, or children born in Italy can start to ask for, for citizenship. But if they can't prove 10 years of uninterrupted residency, so just think about that as a student, if you guys could prove 10 years of uninterrupted residency that you can document, then they can apply, then they can ask for citizenship. Um, so they, they identify as Italian, they don't have a home country, they are often without passport. That means they can't vote, they can't leave the country, they can't have any kind of a job that's, that's connected to the state, they couldn't be teachers. One of the pictures I had but I didn't, I didn't talk about was Alessia Kosakova, who has been the four-time Italian championship for Taekwondo. She's been waiting for over three years for her citizenship request and she can't go to the Olympics even though she's qualified for them because she doesn't have a passport. She's not Italian. So um, why is it this way? I didn't really answer your question all the way. Why it's this way? In Europe, most European countries have uh, a youth sanguinis law. You have to have been born there. I think it's the power of a tradition. And if you read section 29, excuse me, section 93 as I did, that says that, that the traditions of men will take away truth. Every time I read that in section 93, this is what I think about. I think about how sometimes we do things just because it's a tradition. And then it certainly, you know, supports institutional powers in certain ways. But if you're going to exploit people like as workers, you have to kind of dehumanize them first. So you can look at a more insidious reason, but I think a lot of it's the power of the tradition. All right, um, we'll take time for just a couple more questions. But Lauren asked, you discussed the great disparity between the number of indigenous peoples in Australia and the number of incar incarcerated indigenous people in Australia. Mm -hmm. Are there laws that discriminate against Indigenous people in Australia? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And a lot of those are, uh, some of them are cultural. This isn't my total area of expertise, but a lot of them are cultural. And a lot of them are, um, in terms of like what's on the books, I don't want to go there because I don't want to misspeak. Um, but the things I read about were mostly culturally enforced, as they are in Brazil. The kinds of things, as I say, that are that are prejudicial attitudes. That you know, those kinds of things that show that manifest themselves by microaggressions and exclusions, and you know, housing access and those kinds of things, and economic, uh, excuse me, um, educational disparity and that kind of thing. But I will have to, or you guys can look and see what kinds of things are on the books about exclusion of indigenous people. Historically, there were, of course. I mean, they weren't allowed to have citizenship and other things like that. But about Australia, I don't dare speak with authority. 
All right, and we'll just end with this question by Rebecca. Um, Italy was one of the countries that was most impacted by COVID-19, especially at the beginning. So how did this impact the Black Lives Matter protests in Italy? And at what point where the country, at a point where the country was facing such a myriad of struggles? They, I have to just thank in, you know, in my heart, Ariam and Ripanti for their work because they ensured that everything they were organizing with um, followed the very, very strict um, CDC protocols in Italy. Italy enforced its COVID measures. It was, it was completely devastated by COVID because it hit there first in Europe and people didn't know what it was yet. And there were whole towns that were completely shut down. But you have to understand, unlike in the United States, their, their mask measures, their social distancing are enforced by a 300 euro fine. So people follow, people follow the, the procedures. <clears throat> Excuse me. So those did happen, but again, the it, the the presence of COVID, as it did here, brought up the fact that a lot of people who are lower income also that intersects with racial discrimination, and those are also the people who are working most often in the really essential kinds of jobs. So there was that kind of debate that came up as well. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Orkin. Unfortunately, I wish we could ask all the questions on here, but we don't have the time. I could do it all day. People can come to my office or send me emails because this is my thing, people. I'm happy to talk about it until you tell me to stop.